Good, we're recording. Okay, everyone, it is Gordon Einstein, your Dubai resident crypto attorney, originally, of course, from the United States, licensed from there. And I'm doing something which is unusual for me, but it's a special case. I'm having another lawyer on the show. You know, lawyers are like sharks. They kind of, I don't know how close they get to each other in this space. They kind of keep a respectful distance, maybe. But this guy is special. This guy deserves uh, a place on the show. And I personally have a lot to, to learn from him. And I think that he has deep expertise in areas that are of vast interest, interest to this audience. So James Lassery, uh visiting us, actually in Gibraltar now, soon to visit us in Dubai, um, a attorney and partner with Hassan's in Gibraltar. Hopefully I'm saying this all correctly. James, welcome to the show. I'm very happy to see you again. Thank you very much, Gordon. It's good to see you again, and it's great to be here on your show. Thank you. Thank you. So just, just for the audience, so you understand where we're going with this. Uh, James, as I understand it, and he'll, of course, correct and augment this, has a deep and profound understanding of investment funds, specifically as they relate to crypto. Generally, he's an expert and specifically he's pivoted, which is unusual, I think, to the niche of niches, which is the crypto funds. And he has also a international perspective because which I think you would have to have in Gibraltar, knowing how you can compete with other jurisdictions in a regulatory and, and implementation, implementation basis. So, and there's a lot of recent developments in this area that I think are fascinating. So that's where we're going with this conversation. But as always, I like to ask my guests, you know, where they're from, what's their history? In your case, I'm gonna ask how you got into law, because, you know, I always find that interesting, um, how your practice developed, and then we'll kind of lead up to the crypto funds, and then we'll go do a deep dive on that, if that's okay. With pleasure, yes. Perfect. Okay, where were you born? <laughs> New York City. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right. and, and, and then what happened? <laughs> uh, I was born in the New York City on the Upper West Side. Uh, I had a, a, a charm childhood um, uh John Lennon lived across the street from me, and I even heard the shots. Um, and uh, Mick Jagger lived in my building. Oh, it wow. was, yeah, yeah, it was very, it was very, very cool. Yeah, I'm sorry. Talking. Did you think John Lennon lived across the street from you? Yeah, bro, right after Charm Life. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, yeah, I, 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 read, I remember the day the music died, also. Because uh, you and I are kind of peers. Wow. Okay. I, I know exactly where you were. I, I was there. I mean, not yeah. for that event, but you know, I, I was. I w walked by that corner and you know right. saw everything. Okay. But you're you're in a very entertainment heavy center of New York culture kind of place growing up there. Go on. Upper West Side, Bohemian, Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. uh, the New York City Opera, all all, all of this uh, Broadway, mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, I I I also played a lot of music. And I went to Johns Hopkins, um, and then I and then I studied law, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I got into law because I either wanted to be a professor of music or a professor of law, because uh, both my parents are academics, and uh, so I I struggled with can you live a meaningful life by studying music, and I consulted with one of my teachers. And he said, yes, you absolutely can. And I was glad to hear that. We discussed the reasons why. But then I decided, you know what, maybe it's more practical to study law because uh, I like the way systems work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, so I did study law. And then I started there's working. Lot, you know, there's been lots of interruptions during the show. Sure, go for it. There, there's a lot of, you know, the world I'm in, there's a lot of software developers or software programmers who are also musicians. And the natural question is why? And the, it, it seems to be something along the lines of what you said, which is the structure plus maybe the math and and the object-oriented things of taking small things and putting them together. Is there maybe an analog here between music and law, or is that a stretch? I'm not sure. There are people who study both fields of both fields together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not particularly good in math, so I'm not so I'm not sure. Um, yeah. But but music and law, perhaps. Well, I think harmony. Uh, in fact, that, mm. I, I never thought about this, but probably something that characterizes my my practice is that I like making sure that everyone involved is working in harmony. I'm I'm the opposite of a litigator. Interesting. I, I, I bring people together uh, to 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 work uh, to work off of so that everyone is singing off of the same hymn sheet. Beautiful. Okay, love it. 
Okay, so then you, you you consider your life prospects and you decide to go to law. Um, where did you go undergrad? Uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. Nice. Okay, and for law school? For, for law school, I, w I studied in Israel, in bar -Ilan University. Beautiful. Okay, very well. And Shalom. Um, Einstein. Okay, interesting. So how did you, did you make Aliyah or how did, how did that happen? No. Well, it was it was funny. Uh, Hopkins gave me a lot of credits for the classes that I took in high school. Mm -hmm. And so I, at the end of my second semester, I found out that I was really a junior, a third year student. So I decided to take a year abroad and I ended up staying in Israel for a while and I decided to finish my studies there. Interesting. And was there a young lady involved? Yes, there was. <laughs> there there was. was. Sure, she left now. <laughs> That that always happens. Okay. Just, well done. <laughs> well done. That, well, I mean, I can't claim originality. It's like you know, it's just a love bomb. Look for the woman. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's a that's a radical change. So, how, how did you that's find so living in Israel? What, besides for that love, what attracted you? What was difficult? What, what was your experience? It's a it's a very very can do place. Uh, um, almost almost pathologically so. Um, you know, you're expected to find solutions and it doesn't matter how you find them, but you're going to find them. Um, uh, to be honest, I found uh, studying law in Hebrew a little bit difficult, mm -hmm. um, oh, but I turned that into a plus because I, I review, I, I ended up reviewing all of my classes with a, with a, an Israeli student. And so I effectively went to law school twice. Uh, and so de developed a very profound understanding of what I was studying and enjoyed it very much. That's interesting. And I am going to guess that if you're if Hebrew is an L2 language for you, you maybe look closer into the meaning of the words than someone who's a native speaker, just because it's 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 operating on a more conscious level. Both my parents are linguists, so I speak a few languages. What do you speak? Well, uh, so English, Hebrew, French. I went to the French Lycée in New York, wow. uh, Spanish. A little bit of Arabic, a little bit of Italian, um, so I'm, I'm I'm comfortable with languages. That, that's that's amazing. I'm, I'm I'm very not surprised. Okay, so you you go to law. If I hear you correctly, you complete your legal studies in Israel, and then, yeah, uh, I I worked for the I, I did my articles, uh, my stage as they call it, in the Ministry of Trade, uh, and I worked on international trade and on consumer protection. Okay. Uh, I really liked the idea of consumer protection, but then after a while of working on it, I got a little bit bored because it was very materialistic, very sort of product based. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I found that the regulator didn't have a whole lot of power. Um, so now my my mother's from Gibraltar. Uh, and before I went to Gibraltar for the summers and I fell in love with it. You know, G New York is a great place. Mm -hmm. But you can't say hello to your neighbor. Um, it's not that type of place. You know, you you can't speak to, you don't really speak to people in the streets because you're kind of worried about who's around you. Yes. Where in Gibraltar, you walk down the street and go, how you doing? And everything, oh, good to see you. And it's a very, very warm and friendly place and yet a very open-minded place um, because it's very cosmopolitan. I always say that it's a bit of a, a nanocosm of New York mm -hmm. uh, because here in Gibraltar, you have people... Mm -hmm. uh, from 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 England, from Spain, from Malta, from Italy, um, you have the Jewish community, you have the Indian community, you have the Muslim community. I mean, you have really a lot of people uh, from a lot of different places, and they all get along really, really well together. And so, like they do in New York. Um, so, when I came here, Sorry, I came let me here, let me pause here just because I'm curious and interested. Yeah. The um, so Dubai, everyone gets along, and there's a. They, they A, actually really get along, and B, there's this uh, forced element to it, which is this is not the place where you're supposed to air your non-Dubai grievances, and don't don't even air your Dubai grievances. This is not the place where this is a place to be well-behaved, sociable, you know, practice your religion privately if you're not Muslim, and just generally have a good life if, you, if, you're, if you're into that kind of thing. N New York is, especially more recently, and I don't know what your experience is, but more recently to me, it's, the tensions seem to be bubbling in a way that they weren't necessarily when I was growing up. But you're, you're saying, but in my mind, I'm not sure the dem, I'm not familiar with the demographics of Gibraltar. I, I feel like maybe people get along in a non-forced way. But you, maybe you can talk about that oh, for a minute. Right, it's a very non-forced way. Everyone 
pretty much went to school together. People mm -hmm. know each other. People work with each other. Um, and it's very small. You you know, you know people. There are only, there are less than 40,000 people here. So you mm -hmm. really know a lot of people here. And uh, and if you don't know them, you know their brother or their, or their husband or their sure. sister, you know. Um, so people are pe people are close to each other here and they get along really really well really beautifully it's it's quite spectacular yes. uh, in, in the way the world is today um and and so i fell in love with it and so when i when i uh, had the opportunity when i was in law school actually to come here to hassan's uh, mm -hmm. to work as a summer student i i jumped on it and um oh wow worked for a few years uh, as a summer student and then when I passed the bar, they offered me a job uh, for a year to try it out. So I said, all right, what do I, what do I have to lose? And uh, so I decided, uh, so I, I had worked in the, in the middle as a um, as counsel for a, for a technology firm, mm -hmm. for a satellite communications firm. Um, but they, they offered me this job. And so I thought I, I would try it. I thought that Gibraltar would, would work for me with the way I am. Mm -hmm. and, and it did. It surpassed my wildest dreams uh you know if i were and if i were here we are in 2024 having Sorry? this which is amazing i mean yeah. here we are all, all this time later and on zoom and you know in, in the future looking back at it and what, what, what an interesting choice you made when, when you say you you pass the bar i don't know how this works so is gibraltar part of the english legal i know it has english law but is it actually part of the english legal system or is it its own little bubble or which which bar it's do you jurisdiction uh so it has its own bar okay. but the law is either older english law or european law um, because of the eu which we can discuss yes. um so i passed the bar in israel and then i and then i had to get qualified in the uk so i'm an english solicitor okay um in england and in wales and uh once i got that qualification i was able to just come and get qualified in gibraltar so I'm qualified in three or four jurisdictions. Interesting. Um, and you touched on two subjects that are close to my heart. Can you explain, re-explain for me and explain for the audience briefly, solicitor and barrister, which is something we Absolutely. don't have in the U.S.? No, we don't. We don't. So a a the barrister is the old, is, is really the old uh, profession, which is completely before a court, uh, Originally, it was an ecclesiastical court and then a court of law. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're the ones who wear the wigs. And uh, um, they're generally litigators or or people who deal with conflict resolution. Okay. Solicitors are sort of there. Uh, now, this is very, probably very politically incorrect, but they're supposed to be their sort of assistants in a sense that they prepare the case for mm -hmm. the for the barrister. And they're the ones who actually deal with the clients. The barrister's client generally is the solicitor, not the litigant. Which I heard that the first time and it blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is interestingly, the the barrister's fees mm -hmm. are not paid by way of contract. It's a gentleman's agreement. So they can't sue for their fees. <laughs> Which is why they generally get paid up front. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so be, be, being lawyers, they found a, a way to deal with that gentlemanly nature of things. Okay, and you you touched on another subject close to my heart, which is, you know, obviously the UK was in the, the EU, and then we had Brexit, and I and I gather Gibraltar's interesting geographic position puts you very much at the nexus of this event. You have Spain to the north which is the EU, and you have Gibraltar, which I think I've dragged along, maybe along with Scotland and a bunch of other places, out of the EU. You, what you, was that you, like? <laughs> that is exactly the word that I used. We were dragged out of the EU, kicking and screaming, because we voted in Gibraltar, we voted 96% to remain Gibraltar, to, to remain European. Yes. Um, but we are part of the same member state as the UK, <clears throat> and therefore... When the UK came out, we had to come out as well. And uh, um, so we were all, I remember the day afterwards, we were all in shock. We couldn't believe the result of the vote. Um, a few years later, in retrospect, it has helped us tremendously 
develop our crypto funds regime because okay it, because crypto funds do not work well with the alternative investment fund managers directive that's a fascinating comment that i'm sure we're going to burrow into okay i'm i'm i'm, I'm saving that large cake for the end which will come okay. soon so you qualify in israel you qualify in england and wales you're qualified in gibraltar and then Kind of walk me through your practice as it, I guess, starts develops towards funds and towards crypto funds, and then we'll really hit the meat. Sure. So, uh, so, so I started the first few months at the firm. I, I, I just read everything I could get my hands on, le legislation, articles, cases, and um, I had no idea what I would be used for. They yeah. thought I was going to be used to, to market in Israel, but I was a I was qualified for less than a year. I didn't know how to market. Um, I, I didn't know what there was to sell, and if and if I did, I didn't know why we would why anyone would want to buy it. I, it, was, it was completely foreign to me. So I I really had to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And then someone came with a uh, with a proposal to change to convert three companies, private companies, into public companies, and he had to do it really fast. And because in the one eyed in, in, in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. Yes. So I had dealt with a public company before. Uh, the company that I worked for was was traded on the Nasdaq. So I knew a little bit Wait, about. I, I, I'm sorry. Actually, hold on. I'm, I'm thinking about what you said. You had to convert three private companies to public. Convert, yeah. not take them public, but convert them. Am I hearing well, that? There are there there are two ways of doing it in Gibraltar. What one yeah. one is to actually go public, but yeah. in Gibraltar you you have the concept of the PLC, yes, um, which is a public company even if it's not listed on an exchange. <clears throat> is it, so, is it, I mean, I'm going to talk to my background a little bit. Is it like a game by high in Germany, sort of like? I think so. Like that the 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 corporate form that's meant for a large number of shareholders is supposed to exactly. Be Exactly. Wow. Like okay. You, okay. I, I didn't know that about Gibraltar. Go, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, and so I had to I had to convert these these three companies really really quickly, um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, do statements in lieu of prospectus, and, um, and I got it done. The, no, nobody thought it could be done, and so they figured they would give it to me because if I failed, it didn't matter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I got it done. So um, then someone came from Deutsche Bank. And he said, I want to set up a um, an investment club that's going to invest in Indian private equity companies. So I was then the expert on public companies. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so uh, and, and that's the amazing thing about Gibraltar. You, you really get thrown in the deep end, but you have an opportunity to deal with things that in, you know, in New York or London, mm -hmm. only partners can deal with. And here I was a, I was a first-year associate. Um, That's kind of scary. I'm saying that as a lawyer. The... I had, I mean, in, in this case, I was extremely lucky. The senior partner was my mentor. He, he okay. James, he, he, he was the guy who actually reviewed my work for the first year, and he gave me a lot of time, which I... I God was, bless. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm so incredibly grateful to him. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and he's still... Um, oh, sorry, you, you froze for a second. You said he's still... He's still the senior partner. Uh, 23, still, 24, 22 years later? That, 25 wow. years later, yeah. <laughs> Super. Yeah, and, and, and long may that remain. Um, yeah. The, you know, I'm a little jealous because in the U.S., even when I started to practice, the, the mentoring thing was on the decline. Uh, because with the bigger firms, the expectation was the associates were going to migrate, and not and you don't become a partner where you get your chops. At least at the larger firms, which is kind of a shame. They 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 do the training, but they teach you just they want to get the work right, but they're not actually fully mentoring you. And it's nice to hear that you have that relation. I mean that that's extremely powerful. If you if a, if a German company or individual is setting up a fund for, in, for in, you know, investing in Indian companies in Gibraltar. I hear first year handling this. That, that's epic. I was, I mean, I, I was petrified a lot of the time. 
Uh, I remember the first time, uh, first my first business meeting, but business trip, where I couldn't believe somebody was actually paying for me to get on a plane and go to London and stay at a nice hotel and, and speak at, at a meeting with 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 uh, with twelve other people, and I was representing the fund and 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 Gibraltar Law, and um, you know it wasn't my best meeting ever, but it was pretty. It was a good start. It, it was a good start, and um, that's and, all that matters. And, actually. Yeah, and from there I was able to. Um, to develop the, the the actual product, uh, you know, we 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 set we were initially going to set up as a as a public company listed on listed on on the aim, but then we got some really good advice not to do that, and we and we set up as a private fund, and I was really happy because I was told, by the way, you know, you're doing financial services now, mm -hmm. and so I studied uh, you know, more about financial services, and I was really happy because I found out that financial services is consumer protection for investors. And that really made me passionate. I got it. And, and, and then of course you have your background of what you're doing in Israel with, with the ministry. So it, it parallels over. I, I get it. Exactly. exactly. Um, and so, so I, I set that fund up, which was an amazing experience. Um, Made, made a lot of mistakes on the way, uh, was probably guilty of, of malpractice a couple of times. Um, and, <laughs> but that was a long time ago. The fun was fine. Yeah, no, the, 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 it, it's prescribed and statute of limitations is passed. Okay. <laughs> no, the, 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 fun, the fun did, did, did very well. And I, and I got, had a very good relationship with the managers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so then they started doing other funds. And so I had to, start to analyze the the product that we had in gibraltar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what we had was a product that actually that worked in practice but you couldn't sell it because what we had is legislation that was based on usits but the regulator could give you uh derogations on most of the regulations okay so you have to go in with the regulator what i don't want to i don't want to deal with with a con concentration of assets i don't want to deal with exposures and so nobody would believe that you can actually get whatever you want, um, but but you could. So um, after setting up a few of these, and, I, and after a few years, mm -hmm. uh, I, I came. I I, decided, I, re I realized that we needed more fit for purpose funds legislation, and so some colleagues and I proposed to the government mm -hmm. new funds legislation, which we were in a fantastic position because. We could take whatever there was in the world and choose the best of whatever we saw. Um, yes, and we end, did think, exactly, exactly. And we came up with some things that are that were that, that were specifically Gibraltarian, which other jurisdictions then uh, th then then used for their own regimes, which I was very chuffed with. No, okay, now I, I don't speak I don't speak British English. When you say you're chuffed with it, does it mean thrilled? Oh, I was very, I was very Please, I was very proud. Okay, very good. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, and I remember this was this was one of the meetings. You know, you know how you can you can feel that there are three or four points that actually make your career. Yes. Um, so there was this one meeting. It was a four and a half hour meeting with the chief minister at the time, who was sitting as minister of finance, and and he's a he's a lawyer. Um, a very good lawyer, mm -hmm. and uh, not now a knight and and a, and a king's counsel, and um, he grilled me. He and he's a litigator. He cross and he cross examined me on every section of the law that we were proposing, mm -hmm. and um, it was so funny. There was a there was a section. So he was worried about funds being abused in a certain way. So he wanted only lawyers who were going to be. Uh, who, who were licensed for 10 years to be able to give opinions on funds. And I okay. said, uh, Chief Minister, th that's that's a problem. He said, why? He says, well, because I'm not qualified for 10 years. And he said, and why should I care? I said, well, because I've set up most of the funds in Gibraltar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he says, all right, five years. Uh, Chief Minister. No way. What? <laughs> like, but hmm. well, 
I'm I'm qual I am qualified five years, but not five years in Gibraltar. Ah, oh, all right, qualified for five years and qualified in Gibraltar. <laughs> so they 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 changed the law specifically for me. Okay, I I, I can see why you like a, a a jurisdiction like Gibraltar. That's neat. You know, the 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 amount of cooperation that there is here between the regulator, the government, and the industry is absolutely astounding. When we were implementing the Alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive into Gibraltar National Law, there was an English parliamentary draftsman who came, and he came to a meeting where we had uh, the Minister of Financial Services, the person at the regulator who dealt with funds, mm -hmm. and me representing the industry, and we just went through all of the all of the sections in the directive that give um, flexibility to the individual jurisdictions, and mm -hmm. we chose whatever was best. The meeting took an hour and a half, and he came out of there. His mind, he just just blown away. He says, I cannot believe what I've just seen. Mm -hmm. He says, you just went through the law, and you decided what was best for Gibraltar. Where I come from, this would have taken six months, constant bickering, and you would have come up with something that almost worked. Um, so, but that's that's very that's very emblematic of how Gibraltar does things, and because it's so small, um, you can if you have a good idea and you and you propose it with a bit of humility, you can get things done here. It's it, it it's extraordinary. Uh, not everything, not all the time, mm -hmm. but you can really you can really change policy. You can even change law. When we when we were pulled out of out of the EU. We still had the Alternative Investment Fund Managers Directive on our books. So yes. but very quickly I said, okay, but so we don't want to get rid of AIFMD because we put a lot of work into, into having it and it's a good badge to have, uh, but you can't hold us to it either. So let's just make it optional because we don't get it that it brings. So don't burden us with that extra regulation. So we would so we came up with the funds dual regime, which is now law in Gibraltar because of because of what we did. Um yeah, does that mean it's, it's like in the alternative, like you know, check a box and you either want to be under this law or you want to be under this law? How, how, does, how does it work? The way it works is that the in in the AIFMD uh in the in the in the AFM directive, there are three exemptions uh, for governments, for yes. for uh, family offices. And, uh, and and the de minimis, um, you know, for, for small funds. Okay. We just we just created a fourth that if you elect, if you notify the regulator that you do not want to be bound by this law, you're no longer bound by it. The regulator has a few days to to, to come back and 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 because they they had no interest in our funds being bound by it either. Mm. It was only because you were going to get the marketing passport. Um, with 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 the directive, but now that we were outside of the EU, we had no benefit from that marketing passport. So he said, neither should we have to bear the burden of this this regulation, which, in retrospect, you know, I, in, in in retrospect, we now have a crypto funds jurisdiction mm -hmm. because of that, uh, even though we didn't know it at the time. It's it's funny where blessings come from. Incredible. Okay. And it's funny how sometimes the best choices in life weren't really choices. They're just something you did, or maybe they're choices, but they seem like unrelated choices. And then they end up being a choice for something else you never thought of at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, this is deep. Okay, so go, go, keep going. This, this is fascinating. So, so I, so uh, back, back to that meeting with the chief minister. So the experience investor fund re regulations came out, and we started setting up these funds. And the the idea of the EIF regulations was that we should be able to launch funds on the basis of uh, notification to the regulator, um, and on the basis of a legal opinion from a senior from a senior counsel, which you helped define. Which I helped define, yes. <laughs> based on your non seniority. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, now, let, let, let me pause here for a second. I feel like there's two stories happening in parallel here. When was this exactly? 2004. 
So the regulations so came we're, out. We're before big. We, no, we yeah, were, we're, sorry, I missed the thing. When, when was Brexit? Brexit was 2016 and came into effect around 2020. Okay. 20. Okay, and, and your your life changing meeting with your, your your regulator as a young attorney was. That was in 2004. Okay, I see what you're doing. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so we came up with 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 fund regulations that allowed you. Uh, to 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 set up a fund and appoint all of the all of the required service providers. You know, you had to have a fund administrator, an mm -hmm. auditor. You needed to have two directors on your board who are authorized by our regulator to be fund directors. Mm -hmm. um, you can have other directors, but there have to be two authorized directors on that board. Your manager can be from anywhere that allows them to manage funds. Okay. Um, which will be important for a later part of, the, of this conversation. Uh, and uh, once you had all those, and you had a, a, and you and you had an industry standard offering document, mm -hmm. you are <clears throat> you are able to launch the fund and notify the regulator within within fourteen days. Okay. So the regulator would now the our regulator does read the documents, and they do have a dialogue with us afterwards to. To sort of check things out, but that dialogue happens on their time. It doesn't happen on the client's time. So, so the fund is does that mean the fund is active. If you if you're if the fund is live, and you have forty days with the regulator making subscriptions, making investments, um, and and then, but because it 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 has launched on the basis of a legal opinion, which by the way the fund administrator has to co-sign, so. The regulator is confident that it will have been set up uh, properly because they have a licensed they have licensed directors on the board, mm -hmm. they have a, a licensed fund administrator, they have a local senior lawyer, so they know that it's I, going I to be. There's up. a little bit of there's a temporary delegation, in a sense. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And then they'll ask. So then once you've launched and they have the papers, they'll say, well, why did you do this this way? And then you can explain yourself. And in my entire career, I I only had uh, two questions mm -hmm. where, where they said, we don't agree with the way that you set this up. Um, and and it was it was amazing because one of them was their interpretation of of, of, of a regulation having to do with with depositaries. Mm -hmm. And it was it was amazing because i was telling him i was telling i wanted to tell them well that's not what i meant <laughs> because i drafted the law but you know once the law is the law it doesn't matter, it doesn't um, matter. Yeah. <laughs> original intent is not part of it oh well, it right. could be actually if it's okay there's a whole different conversation so suppose the regular does come back and suppose they stick to their guns and you've already issued these documents and you've already have subscriptions and payments you go back and amend the documents. Go to your investors. Sorry, how do how do you handle that? Well, in 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 the two cases that I that I that I had, um, the the fund halted trading as a courtesy, not mm -hmm. not because we were asked to as a, as a courtesy. We we fixed the issue that they that 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 they were. They were um, in this in, in 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 fact in both cases the the uh, depository had to. Had to get a specific license, which which they were happy with, um, and uh, and then two weeks later, literally two weeks later, uh, they continued to launch, and that's in my entire career that happened. That's happened to me twice. Not not so bad. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So now the funds that we set up in Gibraltar were all sorts of funds: uh, real estate funds, hedge funds, private equity. Um, uh, all sort of stra strategies, uh, high frequency, algo trading, long only, um, and managed by managers everywhere in the States, the UK, um, the Nordic countries, Israel, um, South Africa, really mm -hmm. all over uh, France. Um, and and uh, so I developed my my practice in that way. And fast forward to 2017, mm -hmm. um, I saw this. Uh, this uh, now, now I'm going to strategically pause you, and you know where I'm going with this. 
there's mm-hmm. your fun journey and then you're, there's your crypto journey. Well, that no, that, that's where I'm getting to. Yes. So, I just got to ask, when did Bitcoin and blockchain first cross your consciousness? So in 2014, um, in 2014, so I, I, I established the Gibraltar American Chamber of Commerce mm-hmm. and we had a trade mission to Gibraltar. We had 22 companies coming to Gibraltar led by Ken Salazar, who several months before had been the U.S. Uh, Secretary of the Interior. Yes. Um, and uh, and we were told that crypto, that, that Bitcoin very much, which was Bitcoin was looking for a home at the time. Um, and they, 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 they a, a, a Bitcoin foundation. Um, okay. Brock Pierce, maybe, or people. Possibly. Okay. Well, okay. When but, you say Bitcoin is looking for a home, all the purists out there just screamed because the decentralized no, no, nature of the, the foundation was looking for a location. Exactly. exactly. Okay, got it. Um, and at the time, it was considered, it, it was it, it was illegal in a lot of places. At the time, it was considered uh, too racy for for Gibraltar, mm-hmm. and they and they didn't seize on the opportunity. Fast forward another another, uh, but but they did create a committee mm-hmm. to to analyze it. So, in two thousand and eighteen. They came up with one of the world's first regimes for DL- DLT regulations. Uh-huh. Now, this is this is when if you want to store or transmit value on the blockchain for third parties, mm-hmm. you need a full financial services style license, um, and that and that we start the legislation was effective on January first, two thousand and eighteen. So we've been we've been really dealing with this with with, with, with this. Um, asset class very much in depth since then and and so which is now why we have such an amazing ecosystem of directors, fund administrators and even banks that can deal with crypto or as i call it proceeds of crypto okay but i'm, I'm gonna re-ask my question though when yeah. did you oh. get first get exposed to crypto was it when that trade dollar vacation came or was it <laughs> So no, no, it was later. Uh, I, I I saw a a, um, a a course offered by Oxford University on blockchain and another one on fintech, and um, I asked my PA uh, who who had been with me for six years. I asked her, "Look, you 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 organize my schedule. Do I have the time for this?" And she said, "James, you'd be an idiot not to do it." So I so, like your PA. You know, you're, oh, you're just, the head of your firm is awesome and your PA is awesome. You are absolutely you're, you're blessed. Okay. I, I am. I am. And so so I so I did the courses and um and there were some guys around me in the firm who were who had started trading trading crypto and um and then and there were there were a few crypto firm funds that that established themselves in Gibraltar. Mm-hmm. Um and then the PWC crypto hedge fund report. Lo and behold, they listed that we were the third crypto funds jurisdiction in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and there you go. And uh, yeah, and so Is now, there one more question, and I promise the rest will be about funds. What, what was your initial reaction, just you personally, to to this field? Was it like, huh? Or was it? Did you see the light, or was it somewhere in the middle? No, I I I I was I was agnostic. I studied it. I asked the questions. I, I, it was very important to me to understand what the value of crypto, or specifically, or at least Bitcoin. What is the value of of Bitcoin? Yes. And it took me a while, but eventually, I did. I, I feel that I that I understood it because you know, other currencies are backed by a promise, mm-hmm. uh, even if they're no longer backed by gold or silver or a basket of metals. They're still backed by a promise from the sovereign government that we will pay we will pay you this amount on on demand of the note. Whereas Bitcoin, there's no such promise by anyone. But someone, someone, and and the answer that people used to give at the time, well, mm-hmm. it is the value that people attribute to it, did not satisfy me at all. Uh, okay. Because, Good answer. So, on what basis do they attribute any any value? 
Well, uh, so someone did a did a, a, a doctorate on mm. on on uh, the value of Bitcoin, and they said that the value, the intrinsic value of Bitcoin, is the ability to transmit value without government or central bank supervision. And at the time, uh, six years ago, mm. he valued a Bitcoin at two hundred dollars a, bit, a Bitcoin. Okay. Well, that, he felt well that, that, maybe that, it was that intrinsic value. No, it was it was valued much higher at the time, but mm -hmm. he felt that that intrinsic value is the underlying value. Now, I you, okay, sure. There can be a premium on it, but that there is some, and and with Ethereum, it's much easier because you have the smart contracts. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so once I understood that, okay, this is this is real, and um, and that Gibraltar's approach to it is that we are going to do it but do it properly mm -hmm. just like 20 20 years before we had gotten into the online gaming business uh which was illegal in most places gibraltar decided to get involved but to do the the world's best online gaming legislation to make sure it was done properly and regulated properly and so now gibraltar has has, has probably the top uh Gaming is, is the probably the, the top gaming jurisdiction in the world. Um, so we decided to do the same thing with crypto, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided, at, and which is to do it properly, to 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 regulate it, to make sure that the people involved are doing what they say that they're going to do. And um, so for, that's why the DLT legislation was so important, because it. It it not only allowed people to get into the business, but all it also gave them a message that the government is happy with this business. It yeah. is happy with this asset class. It is ready to support it, and it feels that Gibraltar's future is tied to this asset class. So, now interestingly, the funds legislation was so flexible that we didn't have to do anything to to make it crypto friendly. Um, uh, and all we did was that we we wrote to the regulator and we got a statement from the regulator, a public statement, that they were happy for us to use the experience investor fund reg regulations in order to set up crypto funds. And, we, and was this a public document? Public document. It's still, I, I, I'm sure it's still on their website, uh, okay. gsc.gi. So you, you don't, you, and, at that point at least, there wasn't a separate regulatory regime for crypto or crypto funds. It was merely an acknowledgement that the flexibility of the existing scheme naturally would cover this asset class. And by the way, we don't mind this asset class. Exactly. But that wasn't enough because, because in the Funds Association, the Gibraltar Funds and Investments Association, mm -hmm. uh, which I've been involved with for the last 15 years, um, we said, yes, it's true. We don't need to have any new legislation for it, but there are things that you need to be aware of, that you need to be alive to, Mm -hmm. which are not in the legislation. So that is why we came up with a code of conduct for crypto funds. We came up with the we came out with the first edition in 2018 mm -hmm. and last year we came out with our second edition. But the first one was the fir world's first code of conduct for crypto funds. Wow. And our codes of conduct are comply or explain. In other words, you don't have to do what it says in the code, but if you don't, you've got a you, you've got a document how did you achieve the same regular regulatory outcome in a different way? Because we acknowledge that we have, we have we have good suggestions, things that you should be aware of, but our solutions are not necessarily the solutions that you want to that are good for you. So, and, and the technology is evolving. So exactly, it's not just the project is different. Is that it may become the views may be right in the beginning, but evolve such that they're wrong because the technology has changed. So exactly. At, okay. at the time, custody was almost entirely uh, cold storage, or maybe some some um, so, some exchanges. I mean, now you now you have fire blocks and you have copper and you have you have a lot of other uh, solutions that are probably a lot better than the solutions we had in two thousand eighteen. Okay, understood. So um, I started I, setting I, up. I'm sorry, the, the codes of conduct did, did those have the force of law? No. They like no, soft, soft regulations they didn't have the force of law, although 
the regulator had to approve them and the and the regulator would have to approve any changes to them but okay. still it's a code of conduct so uh, but the authorized directors every year they need to state on their director return all the areas where they don't comply with the codes okay. and explain why they didn't comply and can, can they if they know they're not going to be compliance and they know they're going to have to do a return stating that can they get an opinion or raise the topic in advance and get a, sort of a written approval in advance before they do the thing that's going to show up in the return? It usually doesn't go that far. So long as you document your your rationale, mm -hmm. the regulator is okay with it. For example, a big area where most funds are non-compliant is that the code says that you need to get insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, you try to get insurance for a crypto fund. It's not so easy. Right. It's becoming better, but it's still not easy. So I would list... I haven't gotten insurance for these uh, for these funds. For this other fund, I managed to get it because of something else. But, And I would explain that the reason why I can't get it is because it's not available, available on the market for any sort of price that is remotely commercially viable. Got it. Understood. Okay. Interesting. Um, well, keep going with the crypto fund story. I have questions, but I want to let you... Okay, oh. sure. So, no, so again... Because our, our regime is so flexible, um, it allows us, you know, there are no specific rules about custody. Um, you, you, you need to have a bank for operational reasons. Um, but, and even if you can't have a bank, like there were, there were some crypto funds that set up initially, not, on, not by me, but, but they were set up without bank accounts. And right. I was horrified. But but I can understand why they would have done it because it's really hard to to bank crypto. But one of one of the the very lucky things that we have in Gibraltar is that there are banks that will allow you to deal with at least proceeds of crypto. Uh, they'll they'll allow you to send. That's my distinguished before. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, so one one of the issues in Dubai, I'm sure you're aware, is it's you, you can more and more get a crypto license. You can more and more get a commercial license. You can more and more get a virtual asset service provider license, but that doesn't in any way obligate a bank to open up an account for you. And without banking, it's hard to operate. It's hard That's to right. pay your landlord unless they're willing to take Bitcoin and you don't want to give up your Bitcoin. Um, is, is is it a different story in Gibraltar? Thankfully, it is. Okay. We have a couple of banks here that are, that are locally based banks. They make their own decisions. Um, it's not head office, which is somewhere else, which doesn't care. Um, they, they they are able to take their own decisions, and they're able to be pioneers. I have to say, the the banking industry in Gibraltar is so responsible for mm -hmm. the success of the funds industry in Gibraltar. I mean, the idea, even before crypto, the idea that you could take an asset which has a fund administrator that determines that its value is X, and put that asset on someone's balance sheet at Credit Suisse or at or at Lombardier is, I mean, you, you can imagine compliance officers and risk managers saying, oh my God forbid, no, oh my goodness, this is crazy. But in but they they particularly Credit Suisse here at the time. Yeah, it's about uh, Credit Suisse probably should have listened. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, they 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 had other problems. They, they were able to bank um, Gibraltar funds and that pushed the industry tremendously. And now with crypto, we have these banks um, that are and, and 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 some brokerage firms that are able to deal either with crypto itself or with again with proceeds of crypto. Um, and that really has allowed the industry to thrive. No, let me ask you, can can a non-Gibraltar fund establish a Gibraltar bank bank account? Uh, it's on a case by case basis. I, I don't speak for the banks, but it can happen. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I think I think you're about to get a stampede, whether they were wards it or not. That's interesting. I mean, obviously you'd want them to set up in, in Gibraltar, but if it, if there's a legacy fund that didn't know any better and is having trouble banking, they could hypothetically operate there. So your your body language is sort of halfway. So I'll, no, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Okay. Um, if if you were to have uh, a uh, like you you had a couple of uh, of managers that that felt that they needed 
Cayman funds, but the, man the managers were in Gibraltar. Um, so this bank was able to, to service them. Okay, I so don't know if there needs to be some rational nexus between the fund and Gibraltar. You just can't choose it. Is what I'm hearing. Or they feel comfortable. You know, if 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 the if the client is is very institutional and they feel comfortable with it, then there's nothing that prevents it. It's just a, it's a question of risk management for them. Okay, fair enough. Now let me can, can I ask you some questions? Please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I I remember being in Gibraltar 2017 18. And it, it seemed like it was going to go whole hog with crypto regulation in general and be the home for these or that, this or that project, whether it's an exchange or a token issuance entity or all this other stuff. And around the same time, Malta was happening. Yeah. It seems like that, I know, taking funds out of the picture, and I know funds is a vast success story. It seems like that didn't happen like it could have or should have. And then maybe Dubai or Switzerland or Hong Kong or Singapore or Estonia, I guess, with the money transmittal. You know, it, it seems like the action happened elsewhere. Is, is that just to be, be real direct? Is that true? And then why, if it's true, why is our funds such a successful outlier from this other stuff that was being attempted? Right. So I'll explain to you why. Um <clears throat> Gibraltar, like like Japan, like Mika will be in the in the EU, has substantive regulation for 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 DLT. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where you're where where you're storing or transmitting value on the blockchain for third parties, mm -hmm. um, and when when you do that, you're almost akin to a bank. So 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 Gibraltar regulation requires you to have. Offices, staff, compliance, capitalization, risk management, and so on. Mm -hmm. A lot of other jurisdictions have have taken, in my opinion, uh, a bit of a shortcut and uh, a shortcut which which perhaps is not the best advised shortcut. What what they have done is they realize that they that under international anti money laundering standards they had to create VASP regimes virtual asset service provider regimes, but which are only anti-money laundering uh, reality checks. But so they have bundled the regulation of these entities in their VASP regime, which is which is a bit a, a bit of a a bit of a misnomer because people will say that they are regulated because they have a VASP registration, mm. but they're not. The VASP registration just says that they that they check their clients for anti-money laundering. But it doesn't. The, the 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 regulator in question will not take a qualitative stance on whether this business makes sense, whether it has uh, redundancy policies, whether it has any investor protection um, uh, uh, policies. It's just. But because you got into the vast regime, so people are able to do their business that way. Now, that's. If if you're looking from a consumer protection uh, and and a and a and a policy perspective, mm. that doesn't make a lot of sense. And but if on the other hand, if you're an entrepreneur, I understand that you rather go that route, and 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 start your business, then maybe at a later point go to a more substantive jurisdiction that has proper regulation, um, rather than take the nine months or so that it's going to take. To get your Gibraltar DLT license, so I I, I I I do get that, but the thing is that crypto funds are in a completely different different pot because our um, our regulation allows you to launch the fund before the regulator even you notify the the regulator of the launch afterwards. So the the regulation is not really involved in the in the in the reality checking reality testing of the of the fund before it launches so so the, the, let, let me poke at that one for a second it sounds to let me reframe it a little bit it sounds like the regular has sort of deputized the professionals to make sure the the funds are 99.9% fine and given the intimate Gibraltar environment, it works. 
the I think Gibraltar tried with non-fund crypto and blockchain. It wanted to do it, and it didn't carry forward. Is it possible that this sort of deputization strategy could work here also? And maybe that's something they could do to like smooth the rails? Um, there is a committee now that is that is reviewing. One of my partners is is, is on that committee where they're reviewing the, the substantive uh, Gibraltar legislation. And they're looking to see whether there's something <clears throat> that can that they can do to to speed it up, um, and it's it's still very early days, and we still have had quite, you know a, a number of very good firms establishing themselves in Gibraltar, and they're and they're still here. Um, but uh, look, I, I'm asking as a Gibraltar fan. I, I love it there. I, no, I, 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 you know I, that right? I, so I, I think you had to make it a success because I I, I got excited back in 2018 and 19 visiting there. You know, staying on the Sunborn, going up and seeing the monkeys, you know, yeah. all, all that fun stuff, and eating all the sardines. I mean, you know, it's a it's a cool place. Um, fantastic. You know, it's it's actually in some ways more British, more British than Britain. It feels like now, you know, they say. the old ways. They always they're still the old ways are still there. But yeah. um, all right, look, I, I don't want to belabor it. I mean, the, the the funds is a clear success story in the crypto sphere and very much holding its own against other jurisdictions. And, you know, you're given a good explanation of the innovation and flexibility of the setup and the, the neat strategy of being able to offer and then get the regulator, not even a rubber stamp, but it's like, you know, they, they have enough of a filter in advance and they don't, they have rational reasons not to worry. Like rational reasons, which is it's unusual. I'm, I'm, I don't think I've heard about this before, but I, I know you want to touch on, and it's on my list, the Gulf Rock crypto solution. Yes, please. Yes, so I was thinking. You know, I I, I went to to Dubai uh, and to, and to Abu Dhabi a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I was speaking with the industry. Um, I, what what solutions do you use? And what I was told at the time, at least, was that for VASPs, for DLT licenses, the Dubai regime is fantastic. In fact, um, I was on a panel, and and. Uh, and so the the, the, um, the moderator tried to pit us against each other, and she said, "What's uh, the best?" Was that an EGM where we met? No, that was uh, well. It, yeah, yes, it was the same panel, but the day before when it was held in Dubai. Okay, fine. Right, um, very good. Okay, go ahead. So, um, with uh, Dr. Marwan, um, who, who's the who's the head of the the, the blockchain council, um, yes. and. Uh, so the, the the we had a very good moderator and she and she tried to pit us against each other and she says what's the best uh, jurisdiction for for crypto mm -hmm. and I think I surprised them but but I, I said well the truth is it depends what you want to do if you if you want to do a, a like a, a crypto wallet or a VASP or a token issuance mm -hmm. the the Emirates have fantastic regimes they're very they're they're very user friendly they're quick. Uh, the the can do attitude here is fantastic. Well, that that's what I had been told at the time, and and um, and and but they're uh, not slow. How, how's that? They're not slow. Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, I mean they're faster than the UK, for example. <laughs> okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Again. All right, go ahead. But I was not able to find a local crypto funds regime that people were telling me was so amazing and fast and easy to work with. And um, I, I felt that there was a, that there was a bit of a lacuna there. And I felt that that is, that was, it was a place that Gibraltar could come and help in a sort of a symbiotic relationship, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of um, Emirates based crypto managers, but they don't have a, crypto funds regime that is as flexible and as quick as they would like. 100%. And I think, and that is where Gibraltar can really help. Um, and the, the local fund administrators, for example, they can, you know, you don't need a Gibraltar based fund administrator uh, for Gibraltar fund. You do need, a, if it's a non Gibraltar based administrator, they need to be, approved by the local regulator, basically just to make sure that they have equivalent fund legislation regulations. Mm -hmm. 
and that they're they don't have any problems with the regulator. Um, but, but you don't need to. Have... But that's the point you were making before. Even before crypto funds, you were saying that a neat part of your career is that you had Spanish clients and French clients and and all over the world coming to Gibraltar, and there's nothing stopping them from doing that. It's that openness that I think contributes right. towards Gibraltar's fund success. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. So, so I was thinking I I would really like to to develop this 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 Gulf Rock crypto solution, mm -hmm. uh, which is where we can work together. Um, and uh, indeed, I'm sorry, keep on remembering. Now I get it. Gulf like Gulf, rock like Gibraltar, the rock. Absolutely. Okay. When you first said it, I was thinking, is, is there some case I don't know about Gulf? That's very clever. Okay, good job. <laughs> That's, uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's really, I think it's really win-win because it's not as if we want to take anything away uh, uh, from anyone. It's just we, we, we are offering a solution that might not yet be available locally. And to the extent that it isn't, we are very happy um, to, to welcome either uh, Emirates managers mm -hmm. or very often the funds are managed, are self-managed, so they can be managed sort of by an Emirates company, um, which will act as a corporate director along with the author, authorized directors. Very interesting. Is there... Is there potentially a way to weave these jurisdictions together? Well, I'm uh, I'm 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 the uh, I'm also the chairman of the Gibraltar Funds and Investments Association, and so I'm 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 hoping to meet with the local regulators, and I know that there are several of them, um, and perhaps create some uh, MOUs uh, between the two between the two jurisdictions, either on a regulator to regulator basis or even. As we're doing with another jurisdiction now on a funds association to funds association basis yes i mean I, i'm going to use inexact language because this is not my zone but just like if you qualify in one eu country i guess you can passport certain things around and gain access to these other markets or be treated equal, as an equal citizen i, I wonder it, it, it's neat to watch these micro jurisdictions for lack of better word compete against the big boys and I, and I wonder if teaming up is, a, is an effective way to do that and how that might be accomplished. Well, I'll tell you one thing that could be accomplished, and you heard it here first. Okay. Um, I, I believe that, it, that at least from a Gibraltar perspective, there would be openness to allowing um, Gibraltar funds to, 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 to accept UAE investors. Okay. Um, so if the, if the UAE... Or, or the different regulators would be open to allow Gibraltar funds to uh, to be to be promoted there. Yes, that, that that could work. That would be quite the news story. That would be really cool. Absolutely, that would be awesome. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, you got, you got my brain spinning. Um, look, it's your show. Normally, I cut it shorter, but this is fascinating. And you're very, you're a great guy, and you've had a huge experience. Is there is there anything else? We're going to talk about your coming back to coming to Dubai. Is there anything else you want to touch on? Well, I just um, another thing that's important, and this is this doesn't only refer to crypto funds; it refers to uh, to all funds and uh, all sort of international businesses. Is that we live in an age of BEPS, where you have to justify the jurisdiction where you choose to situate your business, mm -hmm. and. That means that, and the principal way of doing that is by is by having some substance in that jurisdiction. Yes. With a lot of the solutions that exist now, it's very unlikely. I mean, you're in Dubai. Look at a map. It's very unlikely that you're going to go to the Caribbean for a, for for a board meeting. I'm on the other hand, board. on the other hand, Gibraltar is not that close, but it's not that far <laughs> that far either. It's. I see. Uh, the, you're much more likely to have some substance, at least in the form of board meetings um, in Gibraltar, which which I think is why, uh, you know, there are there are other solutions that are that are that are excellent. And if you're New York, if you're in New York, it makes sense to use those. But if you're in London, if you're in Zurich, if you are in uh, in Dubai, then I really think that Gibraltar makes makes absolute sense. And Gibraltar has its own airport, ladies and gentlemen. And Gibraltar has its own airport. That's right. And I've landed in it. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, does it take private jets? It does. It does. Okay, so, so you, you don't need to always run through Heathrow. You can take a direct shot. Absolutely. Inter Absolutely. Interesting. I've done the, not the Barcelona, but that was a Malaga or Malaga. Malaga. You know, Malaga yeah. and, then, and then taking the scenic taxi to Gibraltar several several times. Yeah, you know? yeah. Right. It's not too bad either. <laughs> no, it's not bad. You know, good food along the way and everything else. Okay. Wow, there's a lot to cover here. All right, so we're, we're going to put this episode in the can, like I mentioned, but we're, we're going to release it shortly before your arrival in Dubai in mid-April? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm coming on the uh, the 15th of, of, of April until the 21st, and I, I, um, I'm I really excited about it. Uh, I've been preparing this for a while, and uh, I'm excited to to meet uh, fund entrepreneurs, crypto entrepreneurs, and um, hopefully I'm going to meet some regulators as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have some meeting with fund administrators uh, because we, we really have something to help them, um, uh, which which I don't think that they that they have so much now. Um, That's great. And any, anything we can do to contribute to your success, uh, happy to do it because I, I I know you're bringing expertise. I know you're bringing relationships. I know you're bringing improvement. I know you're bringing collaboration. You're you're. you're I remember from the very first time I saw you on stage, it was a lot of legal and practical wisdom expressed in, in, in a nice package. So just, you. yeah, we, I, I, think, I think we're, we'll be blessed to have you here. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I know you're busy. I know you're in demand and, you know, it's very nice of you to take the time to come on the show and set this all up and, you know, you're, you're a mensch. That's very kind of you. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. You are too. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.